Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 30 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Lisa Shaver. She is a naturopathic physician and acupuncturist in Portland, Oregon, and her interests lie in digestive disorders such as celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, GERD, SIBO, IBS, etc. And her expertise areas include hormonal imbalances, autoimmune conditions, and neurotransmitter balancing. Dr. Shaver has lectured at the Integrative SIBO Conference, three SIBO symposiums, two gastroenterology conferences, amid other speaking engagements. Dr. Shaver lectures at National University of Natural Medicine's Advanced Gastroenterology class on celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity since 2012. She is the past president and current board member of the Gastroenterology Association of Naturopathic Physicians and she is the Gluten Intolerance Group of Portland branch managers since 2008. As you've probably guessed through that introduction, Dr. Shaver and I are talking about all things gluten, in particular all things celiac disease. And we also touch on uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, what it is and why it can also be just as bothersome as uh, symptoms that people can experience when they have celiac disease. So I hope you enjoy today's episode with Dr. Lisa Shaver. Welcome to the show, Dr. Lisa Shaver. It's so wonderful to have you on the Healthy Gut Podcast today. Thank you so much. I'm I'm very pleased to be here. My pleasure. Uh, we have known each other for a little while now. We, in fact, met um, initially at the SIBO Symposium in Portland in June 2016. And uh, I'd love for you to um, share your story with the listeners around how you came to be a naturopathic doctor with a particular interest in celiac disease and non-gluten, um, sorry, non-celiac gluten sensitivity and also SIBO. Yes, absolutely. So um, as a child, my mother was what we called a health food nut. So she um, loved serving healthy organic food. We had a garden and uh, she always sent us home, uh, uh, sent us away from home with lunch uh, that contained fruits and vegetables. And I just thought that's how everybody ate. And I remember my uh, friends wanting to cha- to trade um, sweets and treats for my strawberries and sweets and treats for my cheese and things like that. So um, I realized that not everybody ate the way I ate, but I lived um, in Southern California where it was sunny and warm and we were outside running around and I grew up sailing, swimming, surfing, playing frisbee, running on the beach and just living a very healthy lifestyle. Fast forward to after college, and I spent four years living in Africa, where I saw people in the village going out into the surrounding forest and gathering uh, leaves and twigs and stems and barks and preparing them in a very specific way. And I realized, wow, that's amazing healthcare. And I remembered my roots in uh, my mom, who never allowed me to have antibiotics and always treated with herbs and with diet and kind of realized that was a passion for me. I was doing public health education and in order to reach people more one-on-one, I realized I wanted to do medicine and I found naturopathic medicine. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's how I found naturopathic medicine. And I was inspired by uh, one of my professors, Dr. Kimberly Winstar, who did uh, gynecology And I spent two and a half years mentoring under her. And initially, my practice was entirely women's medicine. And I found repeatedly, in order to treat chronic um, gynecological conditions, I had to treat the gut. And then I became more fascinated in the gut and a little less fascinated in gynecology. I still treat mostly women, and I'm still competent in gynecology. But really, I love to treat... um, GI conditions, so digestive conditions. And then also an offshoot of treating so many women, I do hormonal balancing 
and then neurotransmitter balancing as if the hormones are off, oftentimes emotions and mental function is off. And then autoimmune conditions just kind of became an offshoot of all of that too. So my four areas of expertise are the gut, hormones, neurotransmitter balancing, and autoimmune. Um, part of the gut was uh, SIBO. And um, I was teaching a science class at the National University of Natural Medicine. And Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis had an office right next to me. And I saw Dr. Allison Seebecker come in and consult and they would look at research papers together because Stephen had a glass window and I could see that they were animatedly talking about things and uh, it went from half an hour to an hour to an hour and a half and eventually I knocked on the door and said, what are you guys talking about? And she would come in every two weeks for this extended period of time and they had discovered this thing called SIBO and they were fascinated about it and little by little I got roped in and... Um, and that was, I don't know, six years ago or seven years ago or something, eight, maybe eight. I don't even know how, how long ago. So that was, that's how I got involved with uh, SIBO. It naturally fit in with my gut background. Definitely. And, uh, and it's really interesting as well. And I can understand why watching uh, Dr. Stephen Stamberg Lewis and Al Dr. Alison Seebecker uh, talking animatedly, I probably would have been exactly the same and thought, what is going on? I want to know. I want to be involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then you yourself have um, uh, quite strong reactions to gluten. Uh, so I'm wondering if that um, has led to your interest in celiac disease and also non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Absolutely. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a very new diagnosis. It's only 2011. In the beginning of 2011, a group of uh, GI experts and celiac disease experts gathered and said, what is this thing that we're seeing where then patients are not responding to the gluten blood tests that are typically for celiac disease, but they are responding to the, to the gluten or gliadin blood tests that aren't necessarily associated with celiac disease. And at the International Celiac Disease Symposium in Oslo in 2011, they came up with the term non-gluten celiac non-gluten, I'm sorry, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Well, that was 2011, but I know I've been gluten-free for off and on for 15 years. And I, when I was eating gluten regularly, I would test myself for celiac disease and it would come up negative. And I was so confused. And so it, I kind of realized that there was this thing called gluten sensitivity on my own and um, started researching it and trying to find out as much as I could. And nobody really knew anything about celiac disease back then. We thought it was rare in my training and is in the majority of physicians who are now practicing. We were all told in our pathology classes that celiac disease is rare. You're probably never going to see it. And the only people with celiac disease, and this is false, are going to be thin and kind of have a wasting emaciated look to them, and they're going to have diarrhea. And that's just not the truth with celiac disease at all, at all. It never really has been. But those are the stereotypes, and so it's greatly underdiagnosed. Um, so I had a hard, because that, those weren't my symptoms at all. So I kept researching and researching, and then I was doing more and more lectures and trying to let people know, hey, it's more than being skinny and having diarrhea, that's not, I mean, there are celiacs with that, but that's not the majority of new celiacs being diagnosed these days. The majority of new celiac, celiacs being diagnosed these days actually have neurological symptoms. So that's anywhere from a migraine to a mental or emotional reaction, anxiety, depression, to literally neurological symptoms, numbness, tingling, paralysis, things that don't look at all like the standard celiac disease that we were taught as physicians. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. So I can't blame physicians for missing it, but it's our job as physicians to constantly be updated. And there's so much to know. I mean, just on celiac disease, there's probably five pieces of research 
weekly that I should be reading. That's just celiac disease alone. And I, I function as virtually a primary care physician. That's a lot of research to keep up with. You know, I'm, I'm researching uh, Hashimoto thyroid. I'm researching SIBO. I'm looking at anxiety and depression. I'm, you know, that's a lot for a physician to do besides running their own business, seeing patients, and trying to figure out what's going on with their patients, just to keep themselves updated. So um, in my state, here in the United States, in Oregon, um, we need to have uh, 50 continuing education uh, hours per year, and I usually get 80 to 100, just because I feel like I there's too much information to know and stay up on. Mm. And I think um, also when one is interested in a subject, it it uh, is very easy to clock up extra hours. <laughs> oh, I know. I just can't say no. I'm like, oh, look, here's another seminar coming up. Oh, that's going to put me over 80 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get to 100. Sometimes I get to 110. <laughs> Can we talk about the um, the difference between or even just a um, brief summary of the differences between celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and also a wheat allergy, just for people that are listening that might not perhaps know the exact differences between those three. Absolutely. So celiac disease was um, is not new. Uh, Cappadocius of Eritrea was a physician back in 200 AD discussing celiac disease. And he even knew there was something about flowers and flower uh, foods made with flowers, but nobody really figured that out. Fast forward to the 50s, and we discovered gluten. Um, from the 20s to the 50s, there was a physician, Dr. Sidney Haas, who created a diet called the Specific Carbohydrate Diet, which was a grain-free diet, and he treated thousands of children. He was a pediatric gastroenterologist and he was famous, very well known, but he didn't quite know exactly what it was. And uh, he actually used banana flour back then, which is kind of hard to find here in the States. But we discovered uh, uh, gluten in 1951, 1952. And um, then it wasn't until um, not that long ago, maybe six, eight years ago, that we realized that celiac disease is 1% of the population, not 1 in 10,000. So 1% is considered a common disease. It's more common than rheumatoid arthritis. It's more common than Crohn's disease. And yet it's not being diagnosed. We think here in the States, maybe 15, 1-5% of all the celiacs have actually been diagnosed. We're doing a really poor job of it. Whereas in some of the Scandinavian countries that have a nationalized healthcare system, they are doing a great job. They're up to like 70%. So they're catching more and more and more. And uh, physicians there get a little ding on their computer when somebody has suspicious symptoms that aren't being diagnosed that are continuing. Whereas we don't have, we don't have that here. So every physician is on their own. Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition. It is inherited. So we inherit the genes from mom or from dad or from both. Just because you have the genes does not mean you will get celiac disease. Um, 30% of the worldwide population has celiac ge genes, but only 1% have it. So uh, it is a permanent condition. It is not a food sensitivity. It is not a fad. There is, however, an increase in numbers of people who have celiac disease, not in our ability to detect it, but increase in numbers. So it has increased since the 50s. What The reason we know is in the United States, they took, um, back in the 40s and 50s, they took blood samples and froze them of military personnel who volunteered to become military. And so these are people who passed physicals and became military. So they weren't ill people. And they retested the blood of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands. And they found a lower percentage of people with celiac disease than currently in the U.S. population. So we know it's on the increase. We don't know why. There's theories whether that is... Um, 
our environment and the pollution, the pesticides, the additives, the antibiotics, whether that's um, our low quality nutrition, leading us to be less healthy, leading us to have more immune challenges, whether that's the increase in gluten in our hybridized wheat here in America. Our wheat uh, has increased in the amount of gluten several fold. Um, some, there's a MIT scientist, um, Stephanie, oh, I, I'll think of her last name. And um, she is um, theorizing that it's the one of the weed killers sprayed on GMO crops. Now, wheat is not GMO here in the States, and it's not available commercially anywhere. But still, this um, glyphosate, which is the, the, the disclosed active ingredient, and some people think that there's other ingredients that are doing harm in the uh, weed killer named Roundup, is being sprayed on wheat, um, to make it dry and brittle and it's easier for a farmer to collect the wheat. Instead of uh, renting a thresher for a week, they can collect all the wheat in a day because the wheat is um, more brittle and easier to collect. So for whatever the reason, celiac disease is on the rise and um, it's, it, can be, um, it can be a very uh, varied condition in its presentation in a whole spectrum, anywhere from silent, meaning you don't see it, you don't feel it. And the physician catches it because they run a bone density scan and the bones are really porous. So that's osteopenia or osteoporosis. You can't feel that. Or super low chronic iron or ferritin on lab tests or chronically elevated liver enzymes, your trans transaminases on blood tests where the physician says, you know, Ashley, you have to stop drinking. And Ashley says, I never drink. It's like, well, why are your liver enzymes elevated? And those are, that, those are silent celiac disease signs. The person can't feel it. All the way to somebody who walks by a bakery and some of that flour is being blown out by a vent and you can smell the cooked bread, which most people love, but that can cause somebody to have illness for weeks and not be able to go to work, you know, just by breathing it in, not even putting it in their mouth. So the range of symptoms is huge. Now, if we go to non-celiac gluten sensitivity, as I said, that's just from 2011. There's a lot of research on celiac disease and a lot of research now on non-celiac gluten sensitivity. It's not a fad. It is a real thing. Uh, it's been determined by science that it is a real thing. Conventionally, there's no testing for it, but we'll talk about testing for it. Um, and it's the same spectrum. It can be from no, relatively low symptoms to very drastic symptoms. And I used to have very drastic symptoms. I was one of those people who could drive by a bakery and I'd have neurological symptoms 30 minutes later. So I'm inhaling it. The flour goes into my nose and maybe my lung passages interacts with my bloodstream and then it's right in my bloodstream and I would have neurological issues. And um, I would personally, I would become ditzy as my husband would say, but I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't remember numbers in particular. So if I was driving and the streets are numbered and say it was on third street, and I had to get to 32nd, I couldn't do that math in my head. I would have to count 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 32 to try to think of how many streets I had to go. So it was pretty severe. And as a physician, it's important for me to remember dosages, whether I'm prescribing conventional pharmaceuticals or herbs, they're all in dosages. And I would think, I know that dose has a two in it, but I don't know if it's two grams or 200 milligrams, or 2,000, and that's pretty dangerous. So I had to figure out what was going on pretty pretty quickly. But going back to non-celiac gluten sensitivity, so the range of symptoms are just like celiac disease. It's the great mimicker, just like a food sensitivity could be a, a mimicker, could mimic any disease. 
So anywhere from uh, eye issues, respiratory issues, gut issues, skin issues, cardiac in issues, urinary issues, gynecological issues, musculoskeletal, so muscle pain, joint pain, etc. It can be any symptom, both celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Non-celiac gluten sensitivity is not autoimmune. We used to think it was a pre-celiac diagnosis, and now we're moving away from that. But some research shows that it has more similarities to celiac disease with both the innate and the adaptive immune systems. So we don't, the more we know, the more we don't know. And it's very confusing. Um, we believe it's permanent, but I've had patients be able to work very diligently on removing it and optimizing every system in their body. And then when accidentally being contaminated, they don't react the way they used to. So their symptoms lessen which is kind of the opposite. Usually with celiacs, their symptoms worsen as time goes on because this immune system becomes hyper vigilant. And any crumb or speck of flour, wheat flour, rye, spelt, barley, that gets into their body, they end up reacting hugely, whereas before they had less reactive symptoms. Now moving on to wheat allergy, Wheat allergy has been around a long time. Uh, Baker's asthma, there's um, an exercise-induced wheat allergy. Um, but an allergy is an IgE, so that's an, an immediate reaction. So that could be anything from instant diarrhea, so that's a little confusing um, if people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity or celiac disease have diarrhea when they eat a gluten-containing product. But they could have um, elevated heart rate or elevated blood pressure. Um, their body becomes in a stress state. They have edema, so that's swelling, swelling of the lips, numbness or tingling on the tongue, a swollen esophagus, so they have a hard time swallowing or breathing, um, hives, itching, to uh, the most uh, threatening, which is anaphylaxis. Um, uh, and um, wheat allergies can be managed by an um, epinephrine shot. So um, wheat allergy is rare, but it does occur. And so as physicians, we need to keep that in mind. So if anybody has unusual symptoms, and, and you can have them both. I have a patient who has celiac disease and wheat allergy. So... Um, differentiating the symptoms, uh, we've been able to identify what are her wheat allergy symptoms and what are her celiac disease symptoms. That's interesting. I was actually going to ask, can you have celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity and a wheat allergy? So it's interesting. You can have both. You can. And actually, I have a patient with a barley allergy. And he was really confused. He said, why can I have a piece of bread made with wheat flour, but I can't drink a beer. So I said, well, beer doesn't have wheat unless it's a wheat beer. Um, it has barley malt in it. So then we tested him for hops because wheat is typically hopped. Uh, a beer is typically hopped. And I tested it for barley and sure enough, it was barley. So um, he ended up becoming a um, cider brewer. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about testing uh, yeah. and something that uh, you said just at this um, at the Integrative SIBO conference that we were both at just recently in Chicago, uh, which was a real um, light bulb moment for me. And you were talking about the importance of testing prior to stripping wheat and or gluten out of the diet, because at least then you can get a baseline reading of where you're at. And I myself was advised to take gluten out of my diet by my endometriosis specialist in London many, many years ago, which I diligently did, but I wasn't tested for celiac disease. And now I'm quite reluctant to go back to eating great volumes of gluten to get 
celiac test done. So let's talk about the importance of testing and also what kind of testing you can do. Right. So the importance of testing. So um, to um, repeat what I said at the Integrative SIBO conference, I said, and I still state, that as a health practitioner, so whether you're a physician, a nurse, a dietitian, a health coach, an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, no matter what your health um, training is, to recommend to a client or a patient to just, let's try a gluten-free diet and see how you do. Or let's try a GAPS diet or a specific carbohydrate diet or a SIBO-specific diet any glute or, or a uh, anti-inflammatory diet. Any diet that means to remove gluten, I believe every patient should be tested for celiac disease while they're still eating gluten every day on a regular basis because once they remove the gluten and they feel better, there's no going back. You can't test for celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity anymore. As I mentioned earlier, yes, there's the genetic test because that's just our genes. We don't have to be eating any gluten-containing grains. However, 30 to 40% of us have those genes, so that doesn't tell us. And then there's those funny 5% of celiacs who don't have the genes. And if you have a Brazilian background, there's a tribe or a village in Brazil where something like 12 to 20% of the population have celiac disease. Huge. And none of them have the celiac gene. So once again, the more we know, the less we know. So if someone is currently eating gluten-containing grains, and let me define what those gluten-containing grains are. So um, I have an acronym that I use that... Um, Gluten-containing grains can affect you from your brows to your feet, okay? So it's brows to feet, okay. So brows is spelled B-R-O-W-S, like our eyebrows, and that's barley, rye, oats that are contaminated, wheat, and spelt. And our feet are F, farro, and frica, E, einkorn, E, emmer, T, triticol, and K Kamut. And I think there's a new one with a K. And that's just not quite in my brain file yet. So those are all the gluten-free grains. Or sorry, the gluten-containing grains. Big difference. So if someone's eating those, um, they have to be eating, say, a piece of um, bread uh, or the equivalent one to four times a day for one to two months before they get tested. So if someone's on a gluten-free diet and they're like, I can cheat now and again. You know, I can have a half a sandwich or I can eat a couple of crackers. They're going to say, no way am I going to eat that much gluten, just like you're not willing, Rebecca, to eat that much gluten for a month to two months to get the antibodies raised enough so that they're detectable. And what's interesting is in testing... What we're looking for is an antibody that's released in this small intestinal lining that indicates that there is actively damaged tissue. So as a physician, if I'm asking someone who's gluten-free to go back and eating gluten, I am as a physician asking them to damage their tissues, which will hopefully heal, in order to test because I wasn't diligent the first time around. So I have found in my practice, the vast majority of people who are already gluten-free and who feel better don't know if they are celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitive and never will. And that's so difficult. So why is it important to test? One, to know if you have celiac disease. And here in the States, if you have celiac disease, our healthcare insurance companies will pay for a bone density scan, or what we call a DEXA, D-E-X-A scan, at any age, whereas typically you don't get those until you reach 40 or 50 years old, male or women. But say a 16-year-old girl can get a DEXA scan if she has celiac disease. 
Also, the insurance will cover a complete vitamin and mineral panel. Since that damage to the intestines decreases our ability to absorb nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and other um, essential ingredients that our body needs to function, most celiacs are deficient in these and might not know them. And that's what typically causes the symptoms are these deficiencies in these vitamins and minerals due to the damage in the small intestinal lining that creates malabsorption. Um, another reason to test that celiac is genetic. So say if I, if I was diagnosed with celiac disease, I got it from my mom or dad and chances are one of them has it. Maybe their symptoms are due to celiac disease. They need to be tested. My brother and sister have a higher chance. My, my children have a higher chance of having celiac disease. And then second degree relatives. So my grandparents, my cousins, my great, my grandchildren also have an increased risk of celiac disease. So they need to know. So if I don't have that celiac diagnosis, they don't know to be tested. And that, that might delay their testing. The typical delay in testing in the Western world is something like eight to 10 years before somebody who has celiac disease who is exhibiting symptoms is diagnosed. Now, I've had patients come in, literally, they've been diagnosed a month before they see me. And that's fantastic. That, that means their physician is on it and is, is acutely aware. But say the physician went to school 20 years ago, they're not, it's not on their radar. So um, knowing about family is super important. Then we also know there's an autoimmune condition going on. And as a naturopathic physician, I approach autoimmune conditions differently than other gut conditions that are not autoimmune. And I have protocols to put in place. Also, if I know there's celiac disease, I know there's damage to the intestines, and I'm going to work to heal and seal and repair that gut and use very specific dietary recommendations to help heal that gut. So those are just some of the reasons that it's so important to test for celiac disease. Also, there are certain cancers that are more prevalent in celiacs than there are um, in the general population. So I want to be on a lookout for those cancers with my celiac population. So that's hugely important. Also, for a celiac who is either cross-contaminated or who cheats, they have an increased risk at it in, in a cancer that's in the digestive tract than other people in the general population. So I want to know if they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, we don't know about that risk, or if they have celiac disease, I know about that risk. I'm going to really push them to be adamantly gluten zero. Not, oh, a little bit of here, a little bit of there. Oh, I was laid up all weekend with, you know, some symptoms. No, 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 no. Gluten zero. Like never, 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 never. So those are my why it's important to test. And what are some of those cancers that uh, someone with celiac disease is more um, at risk of developing? Are they cancers in the digestive tract or are they broader in, uh, in terms of other locations in the body? Mm -hmm. so, there is, so, so there's an increased risk for celiacs with an intestinal cancer, absolutely in the digestive tract, intestinal lymphoma. Also increased risk for thyroid disease, um, sorry, thyroid cancer. Uh, increased risk for brain cancer, and interestingly, a very slightly decreased risk for breast cancer. So that's not a reason to want to have celiac disease. Hmm. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. And what about an, um, the increased risk, or if there is an increased risk of developing something like SIBO with celiac disease? Right, absolutely. So um, unfortunately... When people are diagnosed with celiac disease, they think, oh no, I can't eat wheat. I can't eat rye. I can't eat barley. There's nothing to eat. There's no grains to eat. And then they're introduced to the gluten-free replacement products 
And those have very simple carbohydrates in them with very little fiber typically. They're mostly um, white rice flour, um, brown rice flour, um, potato starch, um, tapioca starch, and they're very starchy, simple carbohydrates that are perfect for feeding small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Also, these foods are often increased in sugar because people recognize sugar where they don't recognize rice flour and they're looking for that wheat taste. So the cookies and the sweets, the, the cakes, the pies, the ever, all of these mixes that you can purchase that are gluten-free are higher in sugar. And that's where that concept of the gluten-free diet is unhealthy. I say the transitional or instant replacement gluten-free diet is unhealthy, absolutely, because it has really very low nutrition. If you're just using the replacement gluten-free bread or gluten-free tortilla or gluten-free English muffin or crumpet or gluten-free biscuit or gluten-free cookie, that has zero nutrition in it. It didn't really have that much nutrition in it from wheat flour, but when people start eating this day by day, three days a week, that's when their nutrition goes down and their risk for SIBO goes up by this overabundance of simple carbohydrates. Also, their gut is simply off balance and any gut that's in distress has a higher risk of SIBO. Mm, and it's so interesting. I'd love to talk about that, um, about how one starts to, once they've been uh, tested, of course, uh, starts transitioning to foods. But it's so interesting. And you've just given me a flashback to when I first went gluten free and I went crazy on the gluten-free substitutes because I was like, oh, I can eat these till the cows come home. And I was buying the gluten-free breads and pastas and cookies. I was eating food that I wouldn't have eaten if it was the gluten version. But I, it's like this switch went off in my brain that was like, oh, it's gluten-free, it's fine. And I kind of went, uh, I went crazy on it for a while. And I started to realize, and I had no idea that I had SIBO, and I'm, I'm pretty certain I had SIBO this whole time based on all my, my symptoms, but I didn't feel good on those gluten-free products. And, uh, you know, I, I can now see why, because if I had SIBO, I was just giving the little critters such a wonderful feed with these really easy to digest foods. And, um, and so I um, moved away just naturally from those gluten-free alternative products and started eating a much more kind of whole food, real food diet and used those gluten-free products as a, a special occasion food, if you like. So if somebody wanted to cook pasta and they were like, what can I cook you? I'd say, here, you can use a gluten-free pasta. But it would be my occasional food rather than my everyday binge on it because you think you can because it's gluten-free food. <laughs> exactly. It, that, that's it. And so many celiacs don't know that. They say, doctor, I'm eating a gluten-free diet. I'm being really good. I'm not cheating and I don't feel well. Well, you, you can't feel well on these low nutrition foods, high carbohydrate foods. We're just not meant to eat that as humans. We're not meant to eat highly processed foods all day. We're just not. So that's, that is the exact same um, strategy that I use. So I say, look, you know, people are shocked. They're overwhelmed. There's nothing to eat. What am I going to do? I tell them briefly, you can experiment with some of these replacement or transitional foods as you transition to a diet. But I say, eventually, we're going to get you to a whole foods diet. You're going to eat whole grains if you're going to eat grains. You're going to eat whole vegetables. You're going to eat whole fruits and nuts and seeds and beans, legumes, and pulses. And we're going to get you off of these packaged product, um, frozen, boxed foods. Those are just not healthy for any human being. They're not. And I think one of the hardest things 
when one goes from that very standard Western diet of cereal or toast for breakfast and a sandwich or a roll or a wrap for lunch, which you've been filling with salad because you think that's healthy, and then some form of gluten generally for dinner, it's such a mind shift having to move away from those um, foods that are so promoted and everyone seems to be eating and they're very convenient. You can get food anywhere on the run with those types of foods and then to move away from moving towards a whole food diet, it can really take a lot mentally to get your head around that, particularly if you're also not feeling very well. Do you have any um, strategies that you work with your patients around how they can begin that process? I do. You know, I have patients just experiment with adding an apple and a salad per day. And I say it can be um, simple, easy, pre-washed, pre-shredded salad to start transitioning. You know, if they're not a cook, that's really hard. But that's something that's pre-prepared. We can buy these bags or plastic boxes of salad and it's a transitional until they can go to the farm, learn to go to the farmer's market and buy that salad that was picked that morning, which has higher nutrient content in it. But in the meantime, just something small, whatever is in season. So um, whatever fruit is in season, whatever vegetables in season, I ask them what's their favorite fruit or vegetable. And I say, add that in every other day and let's alternate with some other food every other day. So they get the concept of variety. So they don't get into a rut of eating the same food every day for their whole year. And then slowly I have them also do a food journal where they're writing down the food that they eat and how they feel. And they can see that when they slip into their pizzas and pastas and sandwiches, they don't feel as well. Whereas if they stay with the whole foods, they feel a little better So that that reinforces, they're realizing that. They're the explorer. They're the one that's having the aha moment and the light bulb's going on in their head. And they say, I feel better. And also, um, I have a big conversation that mealtime isn't only about fueling. It's about relaxing. It's about having a time to yourself. It's about being conscious of what you're doing about tasting and savoring. And I talk about this whole conscious eating concept. And um, if people say, oh, well, I just like to drive through some restaurant and pick something up quickly, I say that you're, that's not going to help you. You can continue, you can make the choice to continue doing that and that will not help you in the long run. That's going to be detrimental to your long-term health. Or you can start to learn take care of yourself, put yourself first, and enjoy meals. It's hard if you're single. It's not as fun to eat alone. But I tell people, invite over a neighbor, invite over a friend, have it be your Wednesday dinner date, you know, Um, cook in batches. And that way you have leftover um, turkey soup with a bunch of vegetables or um, leftover, um, you know, multi bean Indian food or something like that, whatever they're into, I have them cook in batches, freeze if necessary for those quick heat up and go type of meals if they have an event later on. But um, those are some of my strategies that I use. And I just tell them about how the body works and how you know, we need these nutrients for our eyes, for our heart, for our liver, for our kidneys. And we want those organs to stay healthy and vital. And they've been challenged for however many years they've been on a standard Western diet. Mm, I have something that I did uh, when I was going gluten free. Um, and also when I started my SIBO diet was um, I had been single for many, many years. So I was that was that person cooking for one and growing up in a family where I did a lot of cooking from, you know, my early teens onwards for the family. I 
really found it difficult to cook for one versus for four people. So what I used to do was I'd, I'd turn it into little games and challenges with myself where I'd buy, I'd treat myself to a new cookbook and I would, you know, find something that I just loved the look of all the recipes and then I would try to cook out of that new cookbook every week. I'd pick a new recipe that I'd never, something I'd never cooked before. It was a little challenge. Um, I'd always portion up the food. So I would cook, if it was a recipe for four serves, I would cook the four serves, but I would have one for dinner, one for lunch the next day and freeze two. Exactly. I always had meals in the freezer for those times where you were running late or you had a really busy night because you were doing some social things and you needed something to grab easily um, and that you could, you know, just pull something out of the freezer and cook it and reheat it and uh, and then at least you were I was being compliant. Um, I always had friends around for dinner. So generally, you know, a couple of times a month, I'd have a big cook up with all of my friends coming around. I loved it. It was really social. I got to experiment on them because I'd cook a new recipe with them. And I tried to turn it into something really fun. And I think that that's quite important to to not hate our food and to to try and find enjoyment where we can with it because it's nourishing us. It's our life force. Absolutely. And, you know, having friends around and having company is hugely important. So our digestive tract turns on when we're in a rest and digest parasympathetic state. So parasympathetic state um, is the opposite of sympathetic, which is our fight and flight. And people are more aware of fight or flight than they are rest and digest. Our bodies are made to be in this parasympathetic, um, rest and digest state 99% of the day. And what is rest and digest? Rest and digest is when we're laughing, enjoying other people, relaxing, lounging, feeling content. You know, and some people say, I don't even know what that means anymore. Maybe I get that on vacation. Well, our bodies are created to be that way 99% of the day. Our brain, uh, when we say we only use 10% of our brain, that 10% is to um, move my lips so I can speak or itch my cheek. The 90% is what's working on beating our heart and exchanging oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide and uh, regulating our temperature and tasting our minerals in our blood and rebuilding our bones. There's a huge amount of energy that's being exerted. And a lot of our organs only work in that parasympathetic state. So if somebody is go, 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 go until they drop, well, their gut's not going to work. So having friends over, having a cook up and having a bunch of friends over is hugely important. Having a friend over, even having a friend over for tea and just being able to relate that that communication, being able to relax, that's so important for our digestive system and for healing, whether that's SIBO or that celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So you touched on a great point is enjoying ourselves when we eat and enjoying ourselves and relaxing between meals. Very important. Mm, it is. And it's something that I really... Um it's my yardstick these days because I was that person that was go, 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 go. And I'd eat at my desk when I was at work and I'd be rush, 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 rush. And I'd power eat my dinner and I was always doing everything fast. And now I really make a point of slowing down, uh, you know, turning the TV off, turning electronic devices off, really sitting and enjoying food. Um, my partner and I at night, you know, now I, now I have found, you know, a gorgeous love uh, having been single for so many years. And he and I sit down and and, you know, we would generally turn the TV off and we sit and chat. We talk about our day. We enjoy our food. We cook together. And um, it's really enjoyable. It's really nice to be able to do that. But even when I was single, I would, you know, really, and I was, I'd finally figured out I needed to change some things with the way I was living. Uh, I did things that, you know, I would enjoy. Sometimes, you know, if there was no friends around, it was even just lighting a candle and sitting down and kind of signifying that this was meal time and just pausing and feeling really relaxed, taking some breaths before I started to eat. Uh, I found all of those really simple things could often really help. And 
the difference I felt personally with my digestive symptoms was enormous. Those meals when I sat down and I really calmed down, really kind of, you know, visualized my food coming in and providing the nutrients I needed, breathing deeply before I started eating, putting my knife and fork down between every single mouthful to force me to slow down. I could feel my food being digested so much better than when I rushed and um, and that propelled me to keep going because I felt so much better for it. Absolutely. And you'll feel fuller faster. We have these uh, elastic fibers in our stomach that allow that stomach to stretch, but there's also pressure sensors that say, oh, I have adequate amounts of food. But for some reason, there's a little delayed response to our brain and to interact with our hormones that are satisfying us and tell us we're not hungry anymore. So if we rush to eat, we're going to overeat. Whereas if we slow down, like you say, breathe, chew our food, taste our food, put our utensils down and have a conversation or just sit and listen to music if we're single or if we happen to be eating alone, just listening to music will eat less and that is a huge part of of health care in the world now is is overeating and overeating poor nutritious food mm, definitely uh, something that i always um notice when i come to the states and i'm in los angeles at the moment is the portion sizes um australians are um very obese we we sit up there in the t- top three of obesity for the world which is not a good thing to be uh, to be doing but our portion sizes don't seem to be as big um in general as what you can get in the u.s and i was eating out yesterday and i just i was blown away by how big the portion was and you know it was enormous for me but that's the norm for so many people because that's what we've become used to and i think really you know when we slow down and Uh, I've noticed this, I eat a lot less than I used to because I eat slower. So I don't need to eat as much because those signals are now working with my brain. And something else that's really interesting for me is cutting out those gluten-free alternatives, the gluten-free breads and pastas and switching to a whole food diet. I eat far less now because I get satisfied so much quicker and I'm sure it's because the protein and the saturated fats and the good quality fats are higher in my food which is very satisfying and the sugar content of my food is so much lower so I just don't eat nearly as much it's been a very interesting experience for me absolutely absolutely a hundred percent you know being able to Mm go from having, you know, a piece of toast on the run with coffee or tea in the morning to a balanced breakfast, your whole body will feel better. Your small intestine will have more nu- nutrition to heal uh, no matter what's going on. Your stomach will have more nutrients, your esophagus, your large intestine, but also your blood sugar will be balanced if you have a balanced meal, whether that's breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with you. Lisa, I'd like to know your thoughts around um, going gluten-free when one is diagnosed with SIBO, because for the majority of people, they will cut out gluten as part of their SIBO diet. What should somebody do who um, perhaps is in the early stages or pre-diagnosis with SIBO who's listening to the podcast and perhaps their practitioner isn't talking to them about getting tested? What what would you recommend that they do before they do embark on this gluten-free journey with SIBO? I recommend that they become their own health advocate and uh, physicians are becoming more comfortable with their patients being their own health advocates and not allowing all the power and decision-making to be in the physician. So to ask the physician for five tests to rule out celiac disease. The first is called tissue transglutaminase IgA. Tissue transglutaminase immunoglobulin A, or what we call IgA. And then another one is tissue transglutaminase IgG. Then deamidated gliadin peptide IgA and deamidated gliadin peptide IgG. So those are four. Then we run a total IgA. That's to see if your body can even produce these immunoglobulins. 
And if your IgA is low, then we don't know if the low numbers for IgA for the previous two tests are accurate. Because if you can't make IgA, even though you have celiac disease, you won't respond to these tests. So it's really important. And IgA deficiency is very common in celiac. So it's sort of a catch-22. It's this, well, if I can't make IgA, then how can I make IgA to become positive for this test? And it's that's why I always run IgG as well. And it's positive to have both, it's possible to have both an IgA and an IgG deficiency, but it's pretty rare. Now, if those come back negative, it, that means everything's fine. It looks like you don't have celiac disease. There are more broad tests and cassette net really broad to try to catch. So in celiac disease research over the past 50 years, and specifically over the past 10 years, a lot of different tests have come out, but they're not typically commercially available. And there's a lab in Cal California called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X, that has a wheat and gluten proteome and gluten sensitivity test test for about 20 different ways that you could be a celiac or non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So I tell my patients that's sort of the Cadillac of gluten-free tests of celiac, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If you want to be gluten-free, if you want to try to be gluten-free, that's kind of the Cadillac of tests. Um, and then there's this interesting sort of alternative test out there that is run by a gastroenterologist in the state of Texas. And that website is enterolab.com. And the patient orders it themselves. And it's a stool test. So uh, you collect some stool and send it in. So the gastroenterologist used to be a researcher and found this testing to be uh, really interesting. There is some overlap between IBD, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, and celiac disease, and that was what his research was on. And he left the research to join this, to create this lab, to join in the gluten-free community to, to help people feel empowered to diagnose themselves. And he feels that this test is more sensitive and will catch more celiacs through the digestive compartment, which ends in stool, than through the blood compartment, which we use conventionally. So that's very interesting. Mm, that is, that's, yeah, it's fascinating. And one of the other things that I've been thinking while we've been talking is given that celiac disease is an autoimmune condition, if a person has other autoimmune conditions that are present and active in their body, does that mean that because their immune system is kind of overactive and it's, you know, it's not, it's not doing what it should do, that they're at more of a risk of developing something like celiac disease if there's already other autoimmune present uh, conditions present? Yeah. So people with autoimmune diseases uh, tend to develop other autoimmune diseases. And there's some very interesting research on celiac disease. The earlier you catch celiac disease, and we're talking the single digit ages. So if you diagnose celiac by two, age two, you have a lower risk of developing other autoimmune diseases. And then by say six, you have a little higher increased risk. And then say by 10, increased risk. And so with every year that somebody has a celiac disease active and you don't diagnose it, they have higher risks of developing more and more and more additional autoimmune conditions. So that's another reason why I don't say, oh, everybody should just be gluten-free and be very cavalier about it because this is somebody's future um, health and disease development on the line. So no, I don't take a child. I don't see a pediatric population, but I have celiacs tell, tell me, should I have my kid be gluten-free for life? And I say, no, just because you have the gene doesn't mean you'll develop celiac disease. So have them eat gluten. When they develop symptoms, test them. If it's not celiac disease, continue on. Now, some people think that that is the worst possible advice, but we want to know if somebody has celiac disease and catch it. Now, if somebody never eats gluten in their whole life, we'll never know if they have celiac disease. Um, and that could be a workaround. But frankly, as a child, that's really hard. 
You go to somebody's birthday party, everybody has cupcakes, and you don't. You go to a pizza party, you go out to eat, and everybody's eating other foods, and you're eating other. It's hard as a kid, especially a teenager whose brain is not developed. They will cheat. They will cheat unless they know they have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> it is hard. <laughs> Definitely. Um, what to do when symptoms don't improve when going on a gluten-free diet as a celiac? What do you do with your patients when that occurs? Right. Well, just like SIBO, it's not the only diagnosis somebody could have. Same with celiac disease. They could have celiac disease plus SIBO, celiac disease plus CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, or large intestinal fungal overgrowth. Since their gut has been compromised for so long, they could have um, parasites, which are very common. We thought that only people who traveled uh, internationally could potentially have parasites, but now everybody travels, comes home, and they and their kids touch every single piece of fruit and every single product in the grocery department. No, oh, no, I don't think I want that fruit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch five fruit until you know. So, or their child is putting their hands in their mouth or where they shouldn't be, and then they're touching, you know, in the grocery cart, they're touching that food. So, um, or people are preparing our food, chefs who travel internationally to find new sauces and spices and foods come back and they are um, preparing our food. So we have access to parasites more than ever before with this, you know, international travel that's so easy and frequent and common now. Also, we can have a um, overgrowth or undergrowth of uh, probiotics in our large intestine. We can have um, uh, pathogenic um, bacteria or imbalanced commensal organisms. So we can have functional issues. So we're not digesting our food as well as not absorbing our fats, our proteins, our carbohydrates. What's going on in the stomach? Are we producing adequate hydrochloric acid? There's so many other things just in the digestive tract that could be going on that needs to be looked at. And the average physician, if you ask them for these, they some of those there's conventional tests for. But otherwise, a conventional physician might be a little confused about those. So you need to find someone who uh, is an integrative physician, is a naturopathic physician, or is a functional medicine uh, practitioner. And they'll hopefully have a better idea of how to look for these issues and rectify the entire um, gut. So I have so many patients who have told me, yeah, my physician diagnosed me with celiac disease, told me to be on a gluten-free diet, and then they said goodbye. Like, that's just the tip of tip of the iceberg. That's 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 one dot in a grain of sand on a beach. Like there's so much else that has to be done. And um, so I have patients come in weekly for a one hour visit until emotionally and intellectually they've wrapped their head around the fact that they're a celiac or they've wrapped their head around the fact that I've diagnosed them with non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I don't let them go. I also have a nutritionist who works in my office who is gluten free. Um, and she put herself on a gluten-free diet and she feels better and she doesn't know if she has celiac disease or not. So she gets it too. Um, so she can help with meal planning and shopping and um, diet strategies and food strategies so that um, you're not flailing in the wind and, and overwhelmed. Um, even though there's so many online sites, you just don't know who to believe. You don't know who has great information and who doesn't. Yeah, and I think that that overwhelm is so common, uh, particularly in those early stages. And and I think that you know really what I'm taking away from what you're saying is finding the right people that are there for you that can help you um, get well again, and that are going to be able to support you um, through that process because it isn't just a one appointment kind of thing. Um, making sure that particularly with celiac disease, like you say, if the gut is compromised and has been um, in a poor way for some time, as it may well easily be with someone with celiac disease, that they're able to then provide you the care that you need to move back towards health and feel a lot better. And, right, and 
I think one of the things that can be really difficult is we can get fixated on the cost. Oh, I can't afford this. Oh, it's so expensive. Oh, I've spent so much money already. Um, I changed my thinking around that and I started to, instead of talking about how expensive it was, I started to think about the investment in my future self. What was my um, 84-year-old self going to think of myself today and that if I was investing in my health today, I knew that my 84-year-old self would be really grateful for it because (laughs) I will be a healthier, happier, more vital uh, and, you know, loving life 84-year-old woman than I will be if I don't do any investment. It's a bit like not putting any money in the bank, saving for a rainy day. Um, so today I see everything I do to my health, towards my health as an investment in my absolutely. future, Rebecca. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You know, and, and um, you know, and you can't just think, oh, I, I've got this down because uh, you do need to go back in six months and ask your physician to retest, do a blood, blood test and make sure those antibodies are going down because nutritional supplements can have wheat, wheat germ, um, oats, uh, barley, malt in them. Uh, your favorite um, tea can be sweetened with barley malt. You don't realize it. So there can be a lot of hidden gluten, your cosmetics, your chapstick, your lipstick, your um, suntan lotion, your body lotion, your shaving cream. A lot of things have gluten and wheat-based products. So if those antibodies aren't going down in six months, you need to reevaluate. And then you get retested again in six months. So um, initial diagnosis, six months, and then 12 months later. And... Um, I am one to recommend a um, endoscopy with biopsy. Uh, Reason being is um, that severity of elevated tests, so how high your test numbers are, are not necessarily indicative of how damaged your small intestine is. So you could have slightly elevated um, lab tests, but your gut is wrecked, completely trashed, flat, flat, flat. Whereas you want it to have it look like a bunch of um, octopus tentacles in there, like finger-like projections. Um, and vice versa, you can have really high numbers and really your small intestinal lining is not doing too bad. You know, it looks like celiac disease, but it's not severely damaged. So as a physician, I like to know how well are they healing. And so in a year's time, they should be all healed up, all healed up because that under the, those finger-like projections, that tissue replaces itself every 30 days. So you have 12 cycles to replace, to be retested by a little tiny little biopsy. And the biopsy is like the head of a pin. It's dot. It's just a dot. And then um, the little cells that line the top of those finger-like projections, they replace each other every 7 to 10 days. So those cells should all be working great, have optimal nutrition, so I want to see in a year's time, and if they have not been healing, then I want to see what else is going on. Do they have um, antibodies to the tissue below the cells? Do what else? What other maybe autoimmune condition is going on? And that's another thing to look for. If somebody's um, symptoms don't improve on a gluten-free diet, maybe there is another autoimmune condition at play. You need to keep looking and keep looking. So um, I'm I'm all about investing in that future Rebecca, in that future Bill, in that future Justin, in that future um, Jessica, you know, and making sure that somebody is healthy. Unfortunately, celiacs who are contaminated or celiacs who cheat have a greatly reduced lifespan, greatly reduced. So, and they're, increased diseases and and difficulties. So I want to really keep in touch with these people and encourage them to be gluten zero. And if anybody out there is listening with celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, Portland is the destination place to visit. Currently, we have 35 100% gluten zero restaurants. And we have seven 100% gluten zero bakeries. It's an amazing place to live. I can go out and eat 
without a word. And some of these places are also paleo and whole foods and they'll eat it. They'll prepare anything off the diet and some are farm to table. I mean, anything off the menu. So you can just, you know, for example, I don't also eat eggs and sugar and dairy because those foods don't like me and I haven't figured out why not, but I can go to any of these restaurants and there's some who are vegan and I can just really eat very well. So just a shout out to, uh, food tourism that Portland's a great place to come. I agree wholeheartedly. I when I was in Portland last year, I just fell in love with the place for the food. The food was incredible and I really want to come back to Portland just to eat my way around some more because it was <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, you're always welcome to come back. I'd love to host you. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Lisa Shaver. It's been so wonderful to have you on the show today. And I'm sure there've been many light bulb moments um, for people that are listening, particularly those of us like myself that went off gluten and are now thinking, hmm, hmm, I wish I'd been tested and uh, really having some thoughts around that. If people would like to connect with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah, so they can uh, find my website from my clinic, and that's my clinic is called Everyday Wellness Clinic in Portland, Oregon. So usually if you just put into your search bar my name, Dr. Lisa Shaver, and Everyday Wellness Clinic, it'll pop right up and contact me through my clinic. Wonderful. And all the links uh, that we have talked about in today's episode are in the show notes, so people can just go to uh, to them and be able to connect with you just one click away (laughs) thanks again for coming on the healthy gut podcast oh thank you so much for inviting me rebecca it's been such a joy my pleasure all right bye bye I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Lisa Shaver. And if you're anything like me, you would have absolutely thoroughly loved just how easy Dr. Shaver makes it to understand the celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I just find her explanations so easy and simple, which just demonstrates how deep her knowledge really is on these subjects. If you'd like to get access to the full transcription from today's episode or the show notes or any links mentioned, simply head to the healthygut.co forward slash CD, short for celiac disease. And the great news is that Dr. Shaver is going to be rejoining me on a future episode of the Healthy Gut Podcast to go into more detail around non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Uh, We talked about it a bit today on today's episode, but we're going to really deep dive into that. I look forward to sharing that episode with you in the coming months. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in iTunes or the app you use to listen to this podcast. I love hearing your feedback. It also helps other people know that this is the right podcast for them if they're looking for information on digestive health. And come say hi to us on our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest and Google Plus pages. We love seeing you there. We've always got plenty of information being shared, recipes, articles and interviews. So look for us under The Healthy Gut. Coming up on next week's show, we're joined by Dr. Rabar talking all about Lyme disease or tick-borne illnesses and why they can often be a cause or an underlying reason for chronic cases of SIBO that just aren't getting better. I just found it so fascinating talking to Dr. Rabar. I really look forward to sharing this episode with you next week. See you then. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. And as we are fully funding this podcast, if you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast so that we can continue to bring you future episodes, all you need to do is make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. 
We would like to thank Belinda Coombs for the production, editing and original music score of this podcast. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.